So we're dealing with Perek Sheni, called Shor Zaneo, the chapter Mem Aleph, uh, 41. 41? Yeah. So, last uh, part that we discussed, Amor li Rav Nachon bar Yitzchak le Rav Huna bred Rav Yehuda. Rav Nachon, the son of Rav Yehuda, said in the name of Rav Nachman, who said in the, in the name of Shmuel, what did he say? Halacha kedivri chacham. The law follows the sages' opinion that one is allowed to eat the mixture. What mixture? That they they placed a kemach. They placed flour in the charoises. Enos nikeri nosan lechachal ramer isok hamer chelmiad. It says that if, according to Rabbi Meir, if you placed flour into a charoises, it needs to be burnt right away. Right? That's why it says, if Nosan is of miyad, oh, that's regarding chadol, mustard. If, however, he added flour to mustard, again Rabbi Meir says it needs to be burnt. The rabbi said, chacham Rav Yochum miyad. Come Rav Yehuda, come Rav Una, the son of Rav Yehuda, in the name of Rav Nachman, who said in the name of Shmuel, the Allah of Fares Chacham, that you're allowed to eat the flour with the mustard. Okay, so Amar Le Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Rav Una Bar Yitzchak Rav Yehuda. Now Rav Nachman is responding to him. He says, "Zacharoyis is kol mamar, or achadol kol mamar." He's speaking about charoyis. He's speaking about mustard. Amar Le, the man of what difference does it make? So he says it makes a difference because Rav Kahana says that the machlokes between Rabbi Meir and the rabbis are only about chadol. Aval the two charoyis is big rakul itself, but when it comes to charoyis. Uh, everyone agrees that it needs to be burnt. All agree the mixture must be burnt. He said, I have not heard it from Rav Kahana's statement. That is to say, I do not agree with it, that the Machloikis is only about Chardol, about a mustard. Now, if you remember, we asked, uh, the Mishnah said that Chavoises, what is Chavoises? It's not what we think, uh, what modern Chavoises is. It says, of Rashi says, Chavoises is something that was made with vinegar. And they used it for, um, as a dip. They would dip meat in it. Like, uh, you know, when you eat uh, sushi, people take the sushi and dip it in yeah. eel. Yeah. <laughs> they call it eel sauce. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's muck. <laughs> yeah. Eel sauce. <laughs> it uh, says on it. I, I, never, uh, I don't eat sushi still. So. Yeah, I me neither. But uh, <laughs> I sushi. yeah, so you dip, you dip, uh, You know what's eel sauce, right? It's uh, a black thing. Right. Yeah. Soy sauce. Yeah, it's soy sauce. sauce. Yeah, but they, they somehow they, they the call sweet it. The sweet one. They put some junk in it. It's yeah. The sweet one and the, the soy I don't sauce. Know. This is you not, go to Aroma, you look for. Uh, this is this not, is, uh, there's the green stuff there. This yeah, yeah, is very, very maro. This, uh, that's, that's not one of my vices. Okay, so... Uh, others, not that You'll develop. That's where we begin. These things, in the mustard and the crosses, they didn't put, there was no water in it. He right. Chaoises is a dip contains vinegar. It was right. customary to mix in some, to mix in some flour to blunt its sharpness. Right. So all these things, though, <coughs> the fear of leavening, it's fear of flour and water together. Right. But none of these things have water in them. Mustard is no water, right? He so writes, he writes, um, it may not be made with flour on Pesach because the flour will quickly leaven. This law applies only if there is water in the mix. Now, because other liquids are not leavening agents, I guess the H2O has a, has a leavening Right. Um, they put fruit juice in it, put vinegar. Put and it is the water-vinegar combination that accelerates the leavening process. Uh, so th yeah. <coughs> it has to be water. I'm a Ravashi, the Rav It is reasonable to rule in the course of Rav Kahn. Shmuel said, Alocha is not, does not follow Rav Yaisi, who holds that vinegar contracts swollen grains and prevents them from leavening. Remember yesterday we discussed it, that sometimes the way to circumvent the leavening is to throw vinegar into the mixture. It, it and then it contracts. My love, some will say, who the litzomis... Was, was it barley? What was it? Not barley. 
with the uh, the the berries the the uh, mm. wheat berries because they have a, a little bit opening. We said the barley is closed, but the the wheat has the cleft, right? You remember? So yeah. It says, "My love, samusio de leitzomis." Does this uh, not mean that vinegar does not contract swollen grains? Ha chamui mechamo, but it does it does promote the leavening process. Therefore, a mixture of flour and charoises, which contains vinegar, would have to be burnt immediately. Loi, the Gemara says, there's no proof for Shmuel's statement. Dilma le mitzmas perhaps vinegar neither contracts grain, veloi chamui machma, no promotes leavening. Well, so, how do you discuss the properties of vinegar? The vinegar is chametz. No, what vinegar, vinegar, vinegar makes? Why is vinegar chametz? Vinegar is uh, from wine. Yes, uh, so. Depends what what's uh, in the, the ingredients of vinegar. Many vinegar are chametz, but from what I know, it could be t- uh, that in today's vinegar, if they put uh, it's fermented, in, in, yeah, but wine is fermented also, and it's not chametz, right? We we drink one, four cups on Pesach. We drink wine on Pesach. It's a mitzvah to drink on cholamoid wine. It's not chametz, but the, if they don't put wine. if they didn't put flour, chametz is think about chametz is the five grains that. You allow them to be, uh, you you let them leaven. Could be that the could be that you're right. Certain vinegar is has the ingredients of chametz, but in general, why why uh, is wine vinegar? I thought every vinegar. You know, the wine chametz. can turn into. There's a store in the Gemara that wine four four hundred barrels of wine turned into vinegar. Right. There was no chametz there. It just turned into vinegar. It became sour. Sometimes you make a mistake. You're making uh, kiddush, and uh, I had it happen to me once. I was making kiddush. I thought it was wine. It was vinegar. Wait, wait. I was thought like, every vinegar is chametz. That was funny. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what to do after. Not that. necessarily. Not necessarily. And mevashlin. So one may not boil a pesach offering in in liquids or in food juice. Which is a question now, what do you do? Because you did the wrong bracha on... on, on but, uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I don't know what I'm... Right. I'm uh, yeah, so it's going to be the answer. So they once tricked out the Rebbe, they gave him... Uh, they gave him... Vodka, and they... they oh, and, and they told him it's wine, or they made believe that it's wine. And he, he, he said charcoal. He, he said charcoal. He <laughs> could trick him. <laughs> So, Tan Rabbon on Bamoim, scripture states, you shall not eat the Pesach boiled at all in water. Right? The Korban Pesach should not be boiled. It needs to be roasted. And Yel Abamayim, Shah Mashkim and Nain, from where do I know that it may not be eaten if it was boiled with, in other liquids? We say Kalvachim, Omer Kalvachim, what's the Kalvachim? Since water does not impart its flavor to the meat. Mm. Nevertheless, it's forbidden. Other liquids which do impart the flavor to the meat, like people put vinegar and wine into the stew, right? Into the pot of, of meat. Why? Because they want the flavors of the wine to impart, uh, uh, to give flavor into the meat, Right. Right. That usually Local chicken should not be forbidden all the more so. Right. You understand the Kalvachem? You said if water do not take away the flavor and they're not adding flavor of the meat, Kolb and Pesach, yeah. and it's forbidden. How much right. more so if, some, if, if you're putting ingredients that will uh, change the flavor of right. the meat marinate, that should be. Marinate the Kolb and Pesach. Right. Which is a question to me at all in general. If, you wanna, if you're eating meat, you want to taste the meat. Why are we putting wine into the meat? It's a flavor it enhancer. Just exactly. the same as you salt it. But does it take away from the meat flavor? No, it it, it. So if I, if, if for example, eat bread that has uh, salt and, and black pepper and all the other things, and I'm tasting the, the salt. I'm not really tasting... They're saying, so Rebbe, they're saying it camouflages said, the, the taste of... He said, <laughs> he said salt has no taste. I didn't agree with it, but he said salt has no taste. It just brings out the flavor of whatever you're putting it on. To me, it's something. I don't know. It's salt. It's salt. I taste the salt. Right. Yeah, but it's not salty. It's not salty. Right. Maybe he meant that salt um, that is mixed into. Um, let's say you put like salt in, soup. in soup or in, in meat. It brings out the flavor. 
It's a big discussion, discussion about vinegar. Big many, many things about vinegar. Right, I told you, it depends on what... It's, what there's different, kind, it's, uh, right. and there's different kinds of vinegar, but you can definitely get a uh, kosher for Pesach. Yeah, 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 no, no, yeah. but regular. And, and I know everybody ha uses it. It's not like uh, it's, uh, there's no shilas with it. Rabbi right. Oimer, Scripture states in water, I know that but water I'm not allowed to. But if we could back up a second. It says water is forbidden. It doesn't impart its flavor. Other liquors which do impart their flavor to me, they should not be forbidden. Yeah, it, also, it doesn't mean they should even more so be forbidden. Right. That's what they mean. Right. Oh, because it said it's just the English. Yeah. The, the, they should not be forbidden? Question mark. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, <laughs> That's okay. it's like it it's like, like, like how you put the. Uh, <laughs> okay. Remind me the. How they put the emphasis. Yeah. The, 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 remind me the. Uh, they said the one time a guy gets up in shul and he says, uh, Yaakov is a gunner. So the rabbi says, you know, embarrass the guy in front of everyone. I want you to apologize. If you don't apologize, yes, you can't come to shul. Yeah. So, so he gets up and he, he gets up the next week and he says, Yaakov is not a gunner. <laughs> <laughs> you told me to say he's not a gunner. I said he's not a gunner. Right? <laughs> so it's, it, it all depends on the... <laughs> Intonation, the intonation. Yeah, that's a famous story. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's the same thing over here. Other, they should not, they should not, they impart right. the flavor. Right. So, the the should, <laughs> so, but in the Gemara, it's, it, the, it, the Gemara is, is, is uh, common to see this uh, yeah. language. Yeah. So, yeah. Rabbi Eimer, Ba Moim, in water, En Le'ala Maim. I have proof that it may not be eaten only if it is boiled in water. Good. How do I know about... Over here it's a spot. Sham Ashkim and Nine? From where do I know that it may be... That it may not be eaten if it was boiled in other liquids? Many with Koban Pesach. Maybe if you, if you boiled it with wine and vinegar and other things. How do I know that it's not okay as well? Tamud Uvashal Mevushal. The Torah therefore states, or oh, boiled at all, it should not be boiled... Nicole Mokin to teach that it is forbidden in any circumstance, even if boiled in other liquids. You shouldn't boil the cup. My benai. I think yesterday we learned that you were allowed to dress the carbon pesach. What was the word that you were allowed to? It says that, um, you're not allowed to cook it, boil it with other liquids. But oh, basting. But you're allowed to, to the yeah, baste. Yeah, yeah, that's the. That's its own juices, though. Ah, yeah. So that's why. Juice on the meat. Yeah, actual juice. That, you can do that with a, the, What oozes out, you bring it back yeah, to it. Like a turkey, you said the turkey's in the oven. Ah, so it's, it's dry. Then, then, yeah. No, but the juices come, and so then you take a thing and you, you pour the juices back on the turkey. Right. That's basting. If we, if we continue to describe it, we're gonna get hungry. My <laughs> benayu. So, what is the practical difference between them? Ika benayu, tzli kedal. What what is tzli kedal? Roasted in a pot. So it says that there is a difference between them. In the case of Pesach, that was roasted in a pot. You suck up the liquid with this and squeeze it back. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. A thing like this again. Yeah. You go shh shh. Yeah, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, it's a plastic thing. Yeah, yeah, we got that. The Gemara questions the Tanakama. So when you do smoked meat, all the juices are leaving the... Right. Smoked is a different process. Yeah, so... Um, I was in Greece one summer 50 years ago, yeah. and uh, they had a... Uh, Rotisserie thing. Yeah, but, and what the guy did, they had a kid... There's a fire, and it had the whole animal right. on it, skinned, and it was tied to a, uh, to a, a spit, Rod, it's yeah. called, a, spit, uh, yeah. I think it was wooden, and the, they had a kid all day long, so like this, slowly turning, right. so it would, it would drip out, it wouldn't fall, it's, it would stay. My neighbor did it for uh, Easter, he put it in the front uh, oh, yeah. driveway. Oh, yeah. And he had, uh, I don't I hope it was the kid. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't. And the machine, he had this machine yeah. that does it the whole, the whole day. When I left in the morning, it was turning and I came back. He has a wheel that he lowered it uh, to closer to the charcoals. 
And then people were like streaming it <laughs> from directly yeah. from it. So they had it with uh, what's it? It's a machine like this. <laughs> yeah. I saw it over here, I'm telling you, my neighbor was in the front yard. By the driveway, he left it down. I don't know if it was a, it was a, I don't think it was a double acha. So, Tzlikadar, in the case of Pesach that was roasted in a pot, the Gemara questioned the Tanakam of this Paita who derived the law of other liquids through a Kalvachemeh. What do they do with this phrase, boiled it all? It is needed to teach the law taught in his baita. If one boiled a Pesach and then roasted it. What if he did these two things, boiling and roasting? Oh, he did it the other way around. He roasted it and then boiled it. of one is liable for eating it. It's not allowed to eat it. Right, what is he liable to? Lashes. lashes. <laughs> he has to go to Rabbi Lashes. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, what does his name mean? <laughs> now you know. Bishlema, Bishlema, I It is understood. He pronounces it Lashes. <laughs> Isn't it the same? Lashes? Lashes. Lashes. <laughs> intonation also. Think about him, no, he answers your call right away. You call about a shayla right away. Wow, that's amazing. It's very it's uh, unusual. Unusual. Right? I remember the first time I started dealing with him. And he'd like call right away. It's like you know, I don't think the hand went around one time. And I was like, Wow. Bishlom, Bishlom, I got slow. It it is understood in the case where he boiled it. And then roasted it. Chayo. That one is liable. Why? Because they are bashed. He, he boiled it. You're not supposed to boil it. But a guy that did the other way around, he first roasted. Elat sloi ve'achakach bishloi. Hat sliyeshu. Torah says sliyeshu. And he did sliyeshu. So this is, that's, it's roasting. What do you care if afterwards he boiled it? Am I? Why should he be liable for la- lashes? Am Rav Ka'ana ha'mani. Who is the Tana of this? Baita Rabbi Yossi. It's Rabbi Yossi. The Tanya Yotzim Beroki Kashorut. Rabbi Yossi says that one can fulfill his obligation to eat matzah with a wafer of matzah that was soaked. What does it mean? Rashi says in 15, it says, after the matzah was baked, it was soaked in water. Although the soaking softens it, it is still classified as bread, provided that it has not dissolved completely. The same applies to matzah that was boiled in water after it was baked. It's amazing because we are so careful that matzah should not touch any liquids. Over here it says that the guy soaked it in water. They changed the wording on this from that to to this one. I know because mine is the older version. Yes. He uses Noah. Right, this is from 12. Uvem Vusha Shalom uses probably Noah also. I can tell by the uh, look. Uvem Vusha Shalom Yimwach, or with one that was boiled as long as it was, it has not dissolved. Even Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yishei Emer, Rabbi Yishei says, Yatsim Birokik Ashori. One can fulfill his obligation to eat matzah with a wafer that was soaked, but not with a wafer that was boiled, even if it has not dissolved. My version is 1990. Right, first impression. First impression. 1998, second impression. I'm on the second edition now. Starting in 2002. Yeah. Anyhow, so the, the Gemara says, Rabbi Yossi holds that once the baked matzah is boiled, it is no longer considered to be a baked product. Hence, in our case, he would rule that if a Pesach, 
if a Pesach is roasted and then boiled, it loses its, its status of roasted, and therefore one would be liable for eating it, as stated in the Baisa. So it's interesting because he says, if it was, once it's baked, once the, the baked matzah is boiled, it loses its identity, so to speak. It is, lo it, it is no longer considered to be baked product, and it's a boiled product. And same thing with Pesach. If you roasted the Koban Pesach and then boiled it, it loses the roasting, and therefore you, you, you're liable for eating it. The Gemara presents a different explanation of the Baita's ruling, that one is liable for eating Pesach that was roasted and then boiled. Ula Omar, Afilu Temer, Abimeir, you can even say that, you, uh, you can say that, that it follows even the opinion of Abimeir, who holds that boiling does not affect the status of a baked matzah. Shani Acha, Doma, Kao, Boshel, Mubushel. It says, in the case of Koban Pesach, it's different because regarding Pesach, it says, oh, boiled at all, shouldn't be boiled at all. Mikol Mo came to teach that boiling a Pesach disqualifies it in any circumstance, even if one boils it after it was roasted. So the Pasuk Boshel Mevushal tells me that I shouldn't be messing with it. I, sh I, I cannot boil it after it, even after it was roasted. Tanwa Bonon. Rabbis taught in a bite, a yochel sloy called soko, it could have been thought that if one roasted a Pesach completely, Yehechayov, one would be liable for eating it. Talmud Leymar, al teichlu mimenu na uvoshem vusha bamoy. What does it mean he baked it, he roasted it completely? It's in, he burnt it. If he burnt it, sloy called soko, one roasted a Pesach completely, Yehechayov, should be liable for eating it. You should not eat. You should not eat it partially roasted or boiled at all in water. The pasuk implies that Hashem is saying, "No, I said to you that you are forbidden to eat it partially roasted or boiled at all." But I did not say that you are forbidden to eat it completely roasted. So you come to Koban Pesach, you can't eat, uh, if you like medium raw, you can't eat it medium raw. It has to be completely uh, well, done. well done. You know that they didn't use uh, metal speed. They used wood. They used, uh, uh, which wood? Said so they used the uh, pomegranate uh, branch. So it shouldn't cook, because when you use a skewer, metal, it cooks it heats up and it starts to cook the meat, the metal. So now it would be, the Koban Pesach would be that the metal is cooking the Koban Pesach. In this case, the it's not because it's wood and the wood doesn't uh, heat up the same way. Ravashi, the Shavir Charucha, Ravashi said where he reduced it to a charred lump. And that, and then it, maybe it would be a problem if he, 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 over, he, over, he did it too much, roasted too much. You can't have it medium rare? Where does it say this? Because it says, uh, the Pasuk says, Al partially mimenu no. <laughs> it says, you should not eat it partially roasted or boiled. So it needs to be well done. What is medium rare? No, no, in Hebrew is that it's still, uh, still you see red. the pink inside the meat, there's like a... I, I, I can't eat, I don't know why, it uh, repulses me, to eat. the meat is raw. I saw a, a butcher once, he, he meat is, is, is raw completely, he takes a little piece and he, he tastes, tastes the meats like that. Like There's a, something called steak tartare, which is, is raw. Steak tartare? Raw. <laughs> raw. Yeah. They eat with mustard. Yeah. yeah. They put a, a raw egg in the raw middle meat. of it. Raw egg and raw meat. <laughs> it's a de delicacy. Yeah, de big delicacy. You say about the cooking. It's All the weird cooking. food is delicacy. Any, anything that is weird. S sushi meat. Right. Sushi meat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Why don't they make a uh, fleshic sushi? If that's the case, they should make uh, Is this? That's, that's it. Steak tartar. Wow. Echidam, Yamaravashi, 
the shaver charucho, he reduced it to a charred lump. Tanu rabban yochal chokazai tchai. It could have been thought that if one ate an olives, an olives volume of Pesach that was raw, yechav is liable. Talmud lema al toichlu mimenu no vashem uvushu. You should not eat partially roasted or boiled at all. No uvashem lomati lecho. I said to you that you are forbidden to eat partially roasted or, boi- or, or boiled. Velochai, but I did not say that you are forbidden to eat to eat it raw. Yochole muto, it could have then been thought that eating it raw should be permitted. Talmud lema kim tzliyish only roasted over fire. Eichi domi no. What is the case of partially roasted? Amar av kedam pasoya barni. It is the same as that which the all the which the Persians call a barnim. It says in 23, the Gemara defines the Hebrew word no by using the Persian equivalent ar- abronim, which was more widely known as, in, in those times. One who boils something in the hot springs of Teveria on Shabbos is not liable. However, one who eats a Pesach that was boiled in the hot springs of Tiberias is liable. You can boil something on Shabbos? According to Rav Chizda, he shouldn't, he shouldn't do it. But if he did do it, he's potu. See, it doesn't say mutar. It says potu, according to Rav Chizda. And uh, if he did, if he, but on the other hand, if he boiled the Korban Pesach in the hot springs of Tiberias, he's chayav. What is the difference about, about Shabbos that renders one not liable for cooking the hot spring? And they told us, because we require a derivative of fire, and that is lacking here. There is no derivative of fire. Chamit Veria is naturally heated by the sun. No, underground. Tveria actually is from the ground. From 29, it says if it's the heat is from the sun. Um, or from the, so the, the Gemara says one that will, so we'll get we we'll get the Pesach Nami, but then with regard to the Pesach as well, Love told the Seishu the hot springs is not derivative of fire. One should not be liable for eating Pesach that was boiled in it. The Gemara says, I'm Rav, my chav de Kitani. What does it mean liable that Rav Chizda stated in reference to Pesach the Kova Mishum Tzliyesh? It means that one is liable for transgressing on account of the Torah's commandment. To eat the Pesach only roasted over fire. And over here, it wasn't roasted over fire. That's why it's liable. But there's no told the sesh. It's still not a derivative of fire, Chamei Teveria, the hot springs of Teveria. Rav Chia Bar Abreide, Rav Nosa Masna Loh, Masna Loh, Loh, the Rav Chizda Behedia, the son of Rav Chia, the son of, of Rav Nosa, taught Rav Chizda statement explicitly in accordance with the inter- this interpretation. I'm Rav Chizda, I'm Vashar, Vacham Yitver, Vishar, Spoto, one who boils something in the hot springs of Tiberius on Shabbos is not liable. However, one who eats Pesach that was boiled in, in the hot springs of Tiberius is liable. Why? Shavah, Mishum, Stej, because he transgresses on account of the commandment to eat the Pesach only roasted over fire. The Gemara discusses the penalty for eating Pesach that was not prepared in the correct manner. Amar Rava Achloi, no, if one ate a punishable measure of Pesach raw. What is punishable measure? Let's say that he ate more than a kazais. Like a shtaim, one incurs two sets of lashes, meaning uh, 78, 39 and 39, if he's capable of, of taking it in. <laughs> Mevushal, if he ate a punishable measure, boiled. Would they really administer lashes, or it was just like theoretical? And he had to have uh, witnesses, and it's, and a whole to, to, yeah, it's not so simple to to incur lashes, but uh, they did have uh, this kind. Of, it did happen. Yeah, I remember. I remember. If you during the lashes you urinate. And the, the stage, uh, they have to stop. They stop because you're already embarrassed. They embarrassed you enough. <laughs> like... you drink a lot of water before the last time. <laughs> <It stops. laughs> like the, like okay, the, done. Like Next. The, the, you know, about the <laughs> you you know. put the like this. You're going to get embarrassed anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
And we do it on uh, Yom Kippur, just yeah, as a remembrance for Yeah, before you go on the time. So wine is incurring two lashes. If he ate, so it says number one, one set for violating the specific pro prohibition, you shall not eat it partially roasted, and, on, and uh, one on account of the general prohibition, only roasted over fire. So for eating, violating the prohibition, you shall not eat it partially roasted, and he did. And he didn't roast it, so that's uh, he is liable to two, two sets. Mevushal, if he ate, if he ate it, mevushal, like a time in court, he incurs two. So if he ate it raw, is incurring two. If he's eating it mevushal boiled, he's also incurring like a time. No, Mevushal, if he ate a punishable measure, partially roasted, and, and, and uh, a punishable measure boiled, like a shawla, she incurs three sets of lashes. It says in four, in four one set for the specific provision, she not eat partially roasted. One set for setting, uh, for the second specific provision, or boiled. And where is the third one? Two sets on account of the general prohibition because partially roasted meat and boiled meat are the same as far as the prohibition is concerned. I don't see what the third one. One set for the specific prohibition partially, should I partially, partially roasted. roasted. One set for the or boiled. Oh, and one set for the general prohibition except roasted over fire. Right. One does not incur lashes for violating a generalized prohibition. It has to be specific prohibition. If it's generalized, according to Abaye, he's not liable to lashes. Ikadam, without you, the loyloki, chadam, yes, loki. There are some who say, or those who say that Abaye holds, it is two sets of lashes that he does not incur. One set of lashes, however, he does incur. Ikadam, with chadam, loyloki, there are those who say that Abaye holds that even one set of lashes he does not incur. Because its prohibition is not specific. Kelav dachasimo, as it is in the, in the case of the prohibition against muzzling. You know that uh, if you're using your ox to plow, you're not allowed to muzzle his, uh, his, his mouth. What's the connection? So it says in, in number eight, after stating the law of lashes, the Torah forbids one to muzzle an animal while it, it, it threshes a grain. In this juxtaposition, we learn that a prohibition does not carry the penalty of lashes unless it is similar to the prohibition of muzzling. Hence the prohibition, you shall not eat it except roasted, except roasted over fire is not punishable by lashes because it is general was the prohibition of muzzling is specific. The reason you don't, you don't muzzle the animal is because he, won't, he can eat while he's plowing? While he's threshing. threshing, uh, threshing. Accordingly, one who, eat, one who ate a Pesach partially uh, roasted or boiled would incur only one set of lashes on account of the specific prohibition. If he ate it raw or cooked in hot springs, he would not be liable to lashes at all. You see, the animals are threshing. They're like walking on top of the grain, crushing it. Is that the, mm -hmm. the Or on top of the olives, right, on top of the... Right, whatever. The, but they're crushing it. Mm -hmm. They carry the thing behind them. They have the thing. They have something and they have the, the iron thing. So oh. it goes up. They tied something to their back. And, and and still, they, instead of millstones, they have... They are the one that that, that uh, move the millstone. Oh. Sometimes the move, millstone is heavy. Right. There's a pole that comes out of it. Yeah. They, they tie yeah, them to the circle. pole and they just make them roll around in circles. <laughs> I get easy. What a right? life. <laughs> Thank you. So, Tamar Rabbo, Noach HaKazai, it's now about you. Um, if one ate an olive volume of partially roasted meat on, of Pesach. Oh, one second, I, made, I skipped. It says, Rav Oma Ochal Zog. If a Nazir ate 
a punishable measure of grape skin. What is uh, it's just ate the grape skin. He is not allowed to drink wine, he's not allowed to eat olives, but he ate the grape skin. He's still no good. It's I don't know how he got the skin. I just, it's probably a very tedious thing to get the to he get the skin. To from it. Yeah, so he incurs two sets of lashes. Chalzon, for if he ate a punishable measure of grape seed, the grape seed, like a stein, incurs two sets of lashes. But if he ate both, he ate zog, the skin of the grapes, the chalzon, and the seeds of the grapes, like a shole, she incurs three sets of lashes. Abai Omar, Abai says the same thing, and like in Allah Shabbat one does not incur lashes for violating a generalized prohibition. Some will say, Two is not liable, but for one at least he will be liable. And some say that even one he is not going to be liable. Even for one set of lashes he does not incur. Why? Because his prohibition is not specific. The prohibition against, um, because the prohibition against, as it is in the case of the prohibition against Mazali. So, Tanu Rabon, Ocha Kazais Non Bodyoim, if one ate an olive volume of partially roasted meat while it was still day, he didn't have patience to wait till night time. So he tasted the meat of Kovan Pesach. But he ate an olive volume. You can relate to it, uh, Shmuel. Early <laughs> bird special. <laughs> <laughs> was impatient. So he ate, uh, he ate a little bit from it. But it was it was not co- it was not roasted yet completely. Potu, he is not liable for violating a biblical commandment. However, if he ate an olive's volume of partially roasted meat after dark, chayov is liable. Oh, is that can... mitz- is the fully roasted? Right. Because it's man. Correct. Oh, if one ate an olive's volume of roasted meat. While it was still day, he has not disqualified himself eating with the members of, of his group at night. However, if he ate an honest volume of roasted meat after dark, he has disqualified himself from eating with the members of his group. How did you know exactly in Chatzot? They didn't have a watch. Exactly. Now it's midnight. No, midnight was the time that they had to stop eating. So, so how did you? So exactly. Back back in the day, they were very uh, proficient in the laws, like in the in looking at the stars, looking at the at the uh, calculating calculating the hours from sunset. So they know they knew that. Let's say five hours from sunset is chatzot. Six hours from sunset. How they measure time? Is it, is it sand, what is it called? Sand watch? Yeah, but that's during the day. That yeah, works. exactly. At Why? night, that does not. How you know? Why sunset? When you when it gets dark, yeah. if you have, and you're counting a, a certain amount of hours. Three, three, to, three small stars. Boom. That's. Uh, you count a certain amount of hours, and it's now midnight. I actually, you can tell by the moon. It says it says David Amelech used to wake up at, at Chatzois, at midnight, every night. How did he do it? Because midnight had a, a wind. northern wind. Yeah. The, the northern wind yeah. would start playing the, the, the harp. So I yeah. told you they were proficient. They had, they had uh, ways of knowing how to do it. Okay. In the morning, at yeah, 5.30 in the morning, on uh, Kimberley, there's a, someone has a rooster. Yeah? So cool. every morning I go by, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There he is. There you go. So then, <laughs> it, it says, uh, <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu yes. told the uh, Paro, Kachatzot ha'alayla, ani yotze betoch ami. Around Chatzot, I'm, I'm going out to, uh, the, the Makat Bechorot, the, the plague of the firstborn, will happen Kachatzot, in, in midnight. So it says, because uh, they, if they didn't know exactly how to calculate, the Goim didn't know how, exactly how to calculate. So if you, if uh, Moshe Rabbeinu would say Chatzot, he would say, hey, Moshe is a liar, it, that's not happening. So he told them about Chatzot. You will see it's happening. If, uh, I think he should have said exactly at the time. 
And most of those guys who would have complained, they were firstborns anyway. They, yeah. Right. And they say anticipation uh, to death is worse than death itself. So let them anticipate. Yeah, them. Around, sometimes around. <laughs> wow. I don't know. It's closer, closer, closer. It could have been thought that if one ate an hour's volume of partially roasted meat, while it was still the Yechayo, it should be liable of Adinu. And this is a matter of logic. What's the logic? Since during the time one is subject to the commandment, get up and eat the Pesach roast, the Pesach, Roasted at night, one is subject to the commandment, you shall not eat it partially roasted. During the time, one is not subject to the commandment, get up and eat it roasted during the day. Is it not logical that one should be subject? To the commandment, you shall not eat it partially roasted. So, what is the kalvachemer? If in the time that you are commanded to eat it, if you are still commanded not to eat it raw, how much more so in a time that you're not commanded to eat it, that you shouldn't be eating it raw? When it's time for you to eat, we tell you don't eat it raw. Right. So, how much more so when it's not time to eat that you shouldn't eat it raw? I think it's the opposite. Let's see if the Gama will, 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 will say what, you, what you're saying. There's a different approach. There's two ways of looking at it. Yeah. Oilo, or perhaps, we should not say as, as above, but as follows. When, it, when one is not subject to the commandment, get up and eat, eat it roasted during the day. He is subject to the commandment, you shall not eat partially roasted. But when he is... Subject to the commandment, get up and eat it roasted. In other words, maybe you you are only obligated not to eat it raw when you are obligated to eat it. When you when you you're not obligated to eat it roasted when when it's night time. So I can say that during the day maybe it's not a problem to eat it raw. So it says I he is not subject to the commandment. You should not eat it. Entirely or partially roasted, Valtitma, and do not wonder how the prohibition of eating Pesach partially roasted could be lifted when night falls. Shareuta Miklolo, it's a tzoli. So, since I have a commandment to eat it, maybe I'm allowed to eat it partially roasted. For behold, in the case of roasted Pesach, it is released from its pro pro prohibited status at nightfall. So, having reason that the prohibition of eating Pesach partially roasted should apply during the day, and not at night, the Baita now shows how scripture negates these assertions. Talmud Leymar, Al tichlu mimenu no'o uvo shen vushal bamoim kim tzli eish. You shall not eat partially roasted or boiled at all, in water except roasted over fire. She'en Talmud Leymar ki im tzli eish. There is no apparent reason for the Torah to state except roasted over fire. Why then does the Torah state only roasted over fire? To teach you. When one is subject to the commandment, get up and eat it roasted at night. One is subject to the commandment, you should not eat it partially roasted. But when one is not subject to the commandment, get up and eat it roasted during the day, no, one is not subject to the commandment, you should not eat it partially roasted. Rabbi Oimer Ekwa Ni Boshel, it would have sufficed had I heard, had I read the Torah state, the extra word, Boshel, boiled, Sheyochol, it was added because one could have said, I know only that a Pesach, that a Pesach, one had boiled after nightfall is forbidden. Where do I know that a Pesach 
one had boiled during the day is also forbidden. Talmud Lema, Bosh, Mavush, the Torah therefore states, boiled at all. Boiling, boiled, Mikol Mochim, to teach that a boiled Pesach is forbidden in any circumstance, even if it was boiled during the day. The Gemara notices a contradiction between the statement of Rebbe's and another statement of his. Vahai, Bosh, Mavush, but the phrase... Boshim of Usha boiled at all. Abke Rabbi Litzli Kedaw Lishar Mashkin. Rabbi adduces it to teach the law of, of a Pesach roasted in a pot or boiled in other liquids. How can Rabbi also derive it? How can Rabbi also derive from it the law of Pesach boiled during the day? Imken Le Makro, if so, that it teaches only one additional law, let the Pesach state. Oi boshel boshel, either boiling, boiling, oi mevushal mevushal, or boiled, boiled. My boshel mevushal, what is indicated by the use of two different forms, boiling, boiled, shmat mina tarte, you can evidently learn from uh, two laws from it. What are the two laws? In 27 says, Rabbi derives one law from the extra word that, and one from the change in expression. That even during the day, that one is not, it should not be uh, boiled at, 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 at that time, and also it should not be boiled during the day. If one roasted meat while it was still day, he is liable. So there's, remember, we learned that, that when did they start to roast the meat? On the seventh hour. And that's why, seventh hour. Chometz was forbidden because the Torah said you are not allowed to roast it together when you still have chometz. You still have chometz around. What happened if the guy couldn't wait? He, he used the, the expression early bird special. ADD. Yeah, he, and he did it early. Yeah, there's always some, some people that like to beat other people. They're always davening earlier and earlier and earlier. Yeah. You walk to shore, you see them already coming back. Yeah, they each on, on, on at, at 9.30 in the morning. In Lakewood, it was amazing. They, had, they were, it was in the summer. It's, you could, you could Trying to get it over with. Six o'clock, you could dive in already. Or get it over with. Shabbos at 5.30. They dive at 5.30 in the morning. I have an uncle that he comes back Shabbos at 7 a.m. He's done. He seven goes, a.m. He goes to it very he goes to Dava at five o'clock, minion, seven o'clock, seven fifteen, he's home. Yeah, then and he expects his wife to serve meat. <laughs> no, no. So no, you know what they did no. in Lakewood? They do so, a little kiddush and they I don't know, he learns and then and then Right, he uh, learns till twelve and then he makes the suda. Yeah. I don't know if till twelve, but uh, Yeah. Breakfast. A you couple eat, hours. Shabbos yeah. meal, you have, you have a breakfast. Right. So you have uh, at eight o'clock or eight thirty. You have a Shabbos meal. You yeah. don't have to uh, right. eat meat. You can eat fish and right. You're kind of miss. This way, you don't miss any meals. You know, you have to have breakfast, lunch, and supper. So it's it's exactly uh, you eat at the same time that you eat every day. So you eat eight o'clock uh, breakfast. So you have four meals then on Shabbos. And, and then one o'clock or twelve thirty, you meet uh, another yeah. one, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. And Shabbos is over at nine o'clock at night. And they're doing this. Yeah. But he is he's learning. He's he's always learning. So uh, that's uh, something right. else. He's we'll, not looking to uh we'll give him a pass. Fresh. Yeah. Oh or sleep. He's he's right. learning. Um But it's a minag, it's whatever the minag is. It's a zrizi makdim la mitzvah. The the people that are zoris uh, they're trying to do mitzvahs as fast as they can. So yeah. Well it's like the bris. You got the bris, you know, they want to do the bris, uh, don't delay the myth. So they, they I remember to, uh, when, when they did the bris, they okay, there at, in, in, on time for the bris, right. either at 7 a.m. Why? It's convenient to the Because that's where they live. Oh. So they did the bris while they live. For lived. the hot springs, we mm -hmm. learned it already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was connected with it. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, you have two two uh, ways of, of doing it. One on one hand it says Rizim Magdim Mitzvah. On the other hand it says Beroy Vamadas Melech. 
So right. Chabad saying the reason why we're doing bris later, because I'll have more people right. coming. More people coming, it's more glorious for the king. There's more people present. Because if we're going to do bris over here at 7 a.m., as soon as it's the day, we're allowed to do bris. We're doing the bris right away. You're going to have a barely a minion. What is better to have at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? You have people. hundreds of people coming in. That's much... Uh, it's, 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 so it depends how you... How you what, what do you think uh, is better? What do you think is greater? The Rav Am or... Maybe over there you can do it at 7 a.m. and you still have a lot of people coming. Yeah. All right. So... Back, so back to the... Back to work. Early bird special. Yeah, so... <laughs> If uh, if if uh, if so, if this guy, if if one ate roasted meat of Pesach while it was still day, is liable. If one ate an olive's volume of partially roasted meat of a Pesach after yeah. nightfall, he is liable also. Ketani solid dumia the no. The Brisa teaches the law of eating roasted meat during the day in a manner similar to the law of eating partially roasted meat at night. Ma no belav. What if you're not eating it though? You're not. You say this is not the pesach. I'm just eating. But it's a common pesach. The problem is, it's designated for pesach. It's already designated. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. You, so you you, so it has kedusha on it, and you're eating it before it's time. Ah, okay. it's the only time that you can get away with it, maybe you can say that you ate less than the the it's olives volume. Exactly. But the moment you, you ate this, this is just a this is just a roast beef sandwich. I mean, you know. A, 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 and, and that's the Corbett Pesach. This is roast beef sandwich, and this is the Corbett Pesach. There's no problem you eating regular meat on, on Erev Pesach. Right. The issue is eating uh, the Corbett Pesach itself. You're eating from the Corbett Pesach itself. designate that animal as the Corbett Pesach. Right, and there's also other people involved. There's usually yeah. a Chabura because they wanted right. to be able to finish the, yeah, yeah. the I, kid, I, the lamb. Right. Hmm. I'm just... Okay, I got it. Tanu <laughs> Abba'al so regardless, if, if he ate it roasted, it's the right way to do it. But the problem is he ate it before the time. Or he ate it raw when it's the time to eat it. But it's raw, he's supposed to eat roasted. So either way is chayo. Ketan itzoli, dumya deno. The Baisa teaches the law of eating roasted meat during the day in a manner similar to the law of eating partially roasted meat at night. In both ways it's a violation. Man, I love, I've sleep love, just as now, eating it raw. Is is a, a negative commandment? It's a love. Aftsoli beloves the same thing with roasted meat during the day is also a love, a negative commandment. Bishlama, no, the Gemara says okay, but no, eating it raw or partially roasted. al There's a person who clearly says, do not eat no. Where does it say that I'm not allowed to eat the roasted meat of Pesach before it's time, during the day? Dichtiv. They shall eat me, the meat of the Pesach on that night, roasted over fire. The Pesach implies that at night, yes, it may be eaten roasted, but during the day, no, no. it may not be eaten roasted. So that's what uh, 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 that Pesach tells me that I have to eat it at night and not during the day. It says when you read the Megillah, we have to say, Balai lo ahu, we have to say it out loud. You're learning to read the Megillah, it says you have to say, Balai lo ahu, no the dosh, na samerach, the king couldn't sleep on that night. So here it says, Balai lo hazeh, this night, that's the time to eat the meat, not during the bustle, day. Is that when they mm-hmm. the... Uh... No, no, only when they, they say, Aigeras hazos. Aigeras is this, this paper, this uh, document. And then you have to touch the Igeras, the, the this uh, Megillah. Megillah. What's that? They call a king uh, when the king writes uh, Igeras. King has a book of chronicles. There's the letters, letters. Yeah, the letter of the king has a, a name for it. All right. Anyhow, I love Abomi Klala Seu. So this is a prohibition that is derived from the implication of a positive commandment. Any prohibition that is derived from the implication of a positive commandment, I say, has only the force of a positive commandment, question mark. 
It's only Amal Chiz. The money. Who is the Tana of this Baita? Hamani Rabbi Yehuda he. It is Rabbi Yehuda. The Tani Shoyu Vaseh Salo. We call it Dovet So Scripture states a bull or sheep that has one limb larger than the other or unsplit hooves. You may make it a donation for the upkeep of the temple, but it's not. It is not acceptable for a sacrifice. We're stating it, the postdoc implies that only it, blemished animal, you may consecrate for the upkeep of the temple, but you may not consecrate unblemished animals for the upkeep of the temple. Mikan Ombu, from here they learned, they, they inferred, anyone who consecrates unblemished animal for the upkeep of the temple, he transgresses a positive commandment. So there's, we see that there's some kind of violation that has to do with implication. It's implied. So tomorrow we need the next Sefer also. Yeah, we're going to need the next book. You have the other book? Okay. Have a good day. Have a good day. Successful day. Oh, man. Oh, man. You already had the Aliyah, so now you could... You could Kona, but you yeah. need to. Okay, so we're learning Halacha on Shabbos. Now, uh, Terebus Shukhanoch. 31. 31. Yes, oh. Aimrim, some, there are authorities who maintain that on Shabbos, on a festival, it is forbidden to study anything other than the words of Torah and text that lead to the fear of Hashem. And what? Text, textbooks that lead to, oh, lead to lead to the fear of God. Even reading books of secular wisdom is forbidden because whenever a book does not have any association with holiness, with Kedusha, it is appropriate to forbid its use because of the decree against reading ordinary documents on Shabbos. Accordingly, such books are forbidden even to be moved on Shabbos. Wow. So novels and, and romance books and all these things should not be read on Shabbos because you read them, you're going to say, why not to read my contracts also? And then you might correct, uh, start to make uh, your highlight, underline certain things in the contract, change the verbiage in the contract. And do all these things, right? Change the commission. The the commission. (laughs) There are already novels. And, you know, they they sit there all all day and read these. They're only there if you put them there. I mean... They didn't learn the Antara Meshukhanu. What do you want from You could tell somebody that's been doing this their whole life that they're going to stop. Good luck. There are, however, authorities... You see, they rely on the, the, the other authorities. It okay. says that there are, however, authorities who permit all books of wisdom and medical knowledge to be read on Shabbos. See, books of wisdom, not books of... Uh, even the authorities who, who, who permit it, they permit the books of wisdom, not the books of... Uh, Romance yeah. novels. Nobody in Gone with the Wind on Shabbos. Right. Remember the uh, lady who came to the Rebbe and she and the Rebbe started asking her, it was in the 50s, the Rebbe started asking her about the Shiduchim, the, the guys that she dated. So the Rebbe knew all the guys that she dated. So he told her, what about this guy? She said, oh, this didn't work out. This, that, that, that didn't work out. She kept on like saying, why did this... Uh, and, uh, you know, you try to be polite. You don't want to say, I didn't like the guy's nose. I didn't like the guy's this. I didn't like the, you know. So she didn't want to say exactly what was the, the issue. So the rabbi asked her suddenly, do you like to read? So she says, yes. And uh, the rabbi said, what do you like to read? She said, novels. <laughs> so and then the rabbi gave her a whole spiel about uh, that this is not the real life. What you're reading in the novels Apparently, what the implication was... She had this idea of what the husband should be based exactly, on the novels. Exactly. Based yeah. on the novels, she had these uh, ideas. Because uh, uh. so, you read one book, fine. You read hundreds of them. There's no way 
that his fantasies don't come into your mind, that the, the guy is literally going to come on the white horse and he's literally going <laughs> mean, to schlep really, you out. And, you really believe that she's uh, more of a problem. And that. love will be in the air. <laughs> if she really believes that, she got more of a problem. No, but 19-year-old, what do you expect? You're reading all these books all day long. What do you think you're going to have in your mind? Okay. You're looking at it from a, from a mature perspective, you, someone that went through life, you're saying, oh, what, what were you thinking, right? What were yeah. you thinking? But a 19-year-old that read hundreds of, of books, uh, yeah, I know. Really she called herself an, an uh, advert, ad, uh, reader. An addict. No, no, no. Avid, avid. avid. Avid, avid reader. Avid, -E -E avid reader. <laughs> yeah, that's what the word she used. So, so, was an avid reader. So she, I guess so, she was uh, uh, involved. Th th this is so the Rebbe says this is not real life. I, it's, yeah. She could say, okay, I know it's not real life. This is, a, I'm just whatever. No, but with the fact is that she practiced it because all these guys she disqualified right, based right. on things that she. That, I, yeah, I mean, not, that was know, her guideline. Uh, the yeah, the barometer was, yeah. was the the. What uh, Mr. Uh, whatever wrote Mr. in the book. Ray. Yeah. He could have, a, anyway, a bad perspective without the novels. And books are the worst because they use your mind and your imagination right. of the, of the uh, author. So you get the wrong ideas implanted and ingrained in your mind through books sometimes even worse than any, anything else. Okay, let's go. Because it's not a level of makshava. Yeah. A guy, a guy, a people will tell you they can get more, um, they, they see something that rather than read something, reading is many times worse because when you see it, you see it and it's limited to what you saw. But when you read about it, it now you use your imagination. Yes. Your imagination can add to it a more flavoring and, and things that didn't really exist and that you start to fantasize it's because you're only getting a text. Hearing is, can be more powerful than seeing also for the same reason. Right. Because, you know, you, I'm, you know, like, okay. No, we said the seeing is the verification, right? But it's limited to what you saw. But when you read something, you, now it's, it's open for interpretations. Right. right. I mean, you could you'd be in a dark room and hear noises. You think, what, what am I, you know, you could think, Whatever about the noise, right. it could be, and it could be totally not what you're thinking. Right. So he writes, uh, however, authorities who permit all books of wisdom and medical knowledge to be read on Shabbos, the rationale is that works of wisdom will not be confused with ordinary documents and such works should not be forbidden because of them. It is customary to follow this leniency. So books of wisdom okay. and, a, obviously it's not a preferred, but... If it's somebody is, it can't, it's too hard for him to read the wisdom of Torah, so he's allowed to read other books of wisdom. Yeah. And, uh, and also medical books, medical knowledge. According to this re uh, reasoning, it is permitted to look at a device used by astronomers called... An astrolabe. 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 Yeah, yeah. You see this in the... Anyway, I'm going to tell you Astrolabe. Such an instrument may be turned about and moved just like it is permitted to move books of wisdom according to this reasoning. For what difference is, what difference is there between an imprint made by an iron stylus on copper discs and writing in books? One should not, one should not forbid the use of such devices because a person might take apart the discs and then re reassemble them an act that resembles building a utensil. The rationale is that since these discs are held together loosely, assembling them is not considered as building, as will be explained in section 313. So that's his dialogue for today. Buchim Tiu. That's a...